tonight, Canadians desperate to escape Gaza find the border crossing into Cairo closed off again. The despair for the trapped. The relief for a young family reunited in Canada. Just running, running from place to place to get safe. And the concern over rising incidents of hate here at home. You're a bit more worried because of what's going on. A father and his 11-year-old son shot and killed near a gas station. There's no longer any respect for children, families, innocent citizens. New details on what Edmonton police are calling a targeted gangland hit. Plus, on the eve of Remembrance Day, a heartwarming reunion story. That's when I saw Tom's name, I said, oh my God. The pilot and the navigator, two veterans reconnected by chance. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina, reporting tonight from Ottawa. Good evening, everyone, from the nation's capital, where in just a few hours, thousands will gather here to honor the service and sacrifice of the men and women who fought for freedom. But freedom from the daily torment of war is elusive for the hostages still held captive by Hamas and the civilians in Gaza. A hospital there again caught in the crossfire. This young girl screaming, why God, why? Hamas blamed Israel while the Israeli army says Hamas is using human shields. Tonight, the first signs the U.S. is publicly criticizing the Israeli military over civilian deaths. Israel today lowering its death toll today from the October 7th attacks to 1,200 from a previous estimate of 1,400. And while no Canadians made it out of Gaza today, some did make it home. That's where CTV's Heather Wright begins our coverage tonight. A father meets his daughter for the first time. Two-week-old Sila, born in Gaza, now safe in Canada. Finally, I got my dream. Ahmed Abul Jadian is a permanent resident of Canada. His wife Yara was still living in Gaza, waiting to join her husband when the war began. After fleeing the Jabalia refugee camp in the north, Yara gave birth on October 23rd in a hospital with no water or electricity. I was worried about myself and I worried about my daughter and my birth. While this family has reunited, hundreds more remain in Gaza. 266 Canadians are on the latest list of those approved to cross into Egypt, but the Rafa Bridge was closed today to all foreigners. In Gaza City, Palestinian officials say the territory's largest hospital was hit by an airstrike early this morning. One person was killed and several others injured. We were on the fifth floor, this woman says. Then we found bombs falling on us. Israel says 100,000 Palestinians have left the north since it began daily humanitarian pauses. Still, the death toll in Gaza has climbed past 11,000, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. Far too many Palestinians have been killed. Far too many have suffered uh, these past weeks. Blinken's remarks suggest the U.S. is stepping up its pressure on Israel to do more to limit civilian casualties, while also reiterating its support of Israel's right to defend itself after the horrific attacks on October 7th. 1,200 people were killed, including Mayan Shavit's aunt. Her two cousins are among the 240 hostages. The unknown is what kills us. Today, Israel addressed reports that negotiations are underway for a three-day pause that would allow aid to come in and some hostages to leave. The IDF would only say they are working on a range of efforts that all take time. Omar. All right, Heather, thank you. And mounting concerns tonight about the rising tide of hate in this country triggered by the Israel-Hamas war. In Canada's largest city this week, Toronto police revealed its hate crimes unit was getting a boost, going from six to 20 investigators and eight special constables. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver on the newest targets and the response. Security has been stepped up at the two Jewish schools in Montreal, targeted by gunfire. It's a, it's a, it's a rough day, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. We have to worry about people trying to intimidate us, but we're not intimidated. 
The troubling discovery comes as Toronto's beefed up hate crimes unit investigates the red paint splattered across a downtown Toronto Indigo store, also plastered with posters accusing its Jewish CEO, Heather Reisman, of funding genocide. The conflict in the Middle East is, is what has ignited the anti Semitism today, but the idea of blaming Jews in Canada for a war around the world in Israel and, 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 and with Hamas is really an unacceptable translation. Since the Israel-Hamas war began, there's been a surge in hate crimes directed at Jewish, Arab and Muslim communities. Nader's Toronto pizza shop was broken into days after a fundraiser for the people of Gaza. So we don't want to speculate or anything that this is any sort of hate crime. We are a Palestinian-owned business, and this did happen in this environment. So it's just, it's just certainly unsettling right now. In Toronto, at least 20 anti-Semitic or anti-Islamic hate crimes have been reported since October 7th, compared to just seven this time last year. In Montreal, at least 98 hate crimes and incidents have been reported. But many more incidents likely go unreported. Many of them are, are uh, basically do not want to speak to the police out of fear of not being believed. Today, the prime minister said everyone should be concerned about the rise in hatred and the acts of violence. Omar telling Canadians to support each other. All right, Eddie, thank you. Sick and twisted is how police in Edmonton described what they are calling the deliberate daytime shooting of an 11-year-old boy and his father. As CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier reports, this isn't the first time he's been a target. A small memorial is forming outside a gas station for an 11-year-old boy who loved basketball. His life taken just steps away 24 hours earlier. <laughs> Amid the chaos, this woman's agony was palpable. She identified herself as the mother of the child. Police were called to the scene around noon Thursday. 41-year-old Harpreet Uppal and his 11-year-old son were shot in their car. Both died at the scene. Mr. Uppel was very well known to us, high up in the in the uh, gang drug world. The stolen BMW police believe was used by the shooter was set on fire a short distance away. For me, it's pretty unnerving because I just live hop, skip and a jump from here. This area was very peaceful, so I had never seen anything before here. It's at least the second attempt on Uppel's life. In October of 2021, police say he was the target of this brazen shooting at a pizza restaurant. No one was killed, but again, family members and bystanders were at risk. This really bugs me. There's no longer any respect for children, families, innocent citizens amongst our rival organized crime groups, our gangsters. In yesterday's shooting, investigators aren't sure if Uppel's son was initially a target, but they believe he too was intentionally gunned down. This level of gang violence where families are being targeted has not been seen in Edmonton as far as I can remember. For Edmonton police, it's the latest in a concerning trend of gun violence, mainly linked to organized crime, with nearly 50% more shootings so far this year compared to last year. Investigators are asking for anyone who knows anything, anyone who saw anything, or anyone who might have dash cam footage to come forward. Bill Fortier, CTV News, Edmonton. America's top diplomat urged India today to cooperate with the Canadian murder investigation. CTV's Kevin Gallagher joins us now. And Kevin, Antony Blinken met with his Indian counterpart and the Indian Prime Minister. What exactly did he say? Omar, it's the latest diplomatic push to resolve the dispute between India and Canada. Both countries' Secretary of State Blinken called Friends of America. It's uh, very important that... Um, uh, India work with Canada on its uh, on its investigation um, and that uh, they find a way to uh, to resolve this difference in a in a cooperative way. The RCMP is investigating the June assassination style killing of Sikh independence activist Hardeep Singh Najjar. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau repeated that Canada has credible intelligence. Indian agents were involved and India's response is to kick out a whole bunch of Canadian diplomats by violating their rights under the Vienna Convention? That is of concern to countries around the world. India continues to deny involvement in the death of Najur, a man New Delhi has called a terrorist. Omar? All right, Kevin, thank you. Remembrance Day tomorrow holds special significance for Canada's former peacekeepers. It's the 75th anniversary of UN peacekeeping.
Since 1948, more than 125,000 Canadian troops have served in international missions in dozens of countries. A Nobel Peace Prize was even awarded in 1957 to then Foreign Minister Lester B. Pearson for creating the first large-scale mission. Today, though, the number has dwindled to about 60 in a handful of regions. I had the chance to speak with this country's most well-known peacekeeper, retired Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire. From the Middle East to Asia, Europe and Africa, wherever there has been major conflict, Canada has long had a tradition of trying to help foster peace. You need a, a, an independent neutral capability there, uh, sort of like a referee. In the 1990s, Canada was the largest contributor with thousands of troops worldwide. Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire famously commanded the ill-fated mission in Rwanda, desperately trying to stop the genocide that would claim 800,000 lives. All of us as members of the international community failed in Rwanda. The catastrophic scenario uh, of not just the, the UN but the whole of the world states not, not intervening, not providing the UN with assets. Over the following decade, Canada's commitment began to drop dramatically. In 2020, it reached an all-time low of just 34 peacekeepers globally. At one point, we had 3,300 troops deployed in peacekeeping. The loss of a major contribution to peacekeeping has definitely decreased Canada's role in the world. Peace operations specialist Walter Dorn argues that cost isn't the issue. Peacekeeping is not expensive. The UN reimburses for the majority of a troop contributor's costs. Rather, it's the risk. About 130 Canadian peacekeepers have lost their lives. They don't want Canadian soldiers coming back in body bags. They also don't want any embarrassments like happened to the Canadian forces in Somalia. A risk General Dallaire feels the world should still be prepared to take in current conflicts now. We should have crossed that western border of Ukraine the same day that the Russians crossed the eastern border. In 2016, the Liberal government promised $450 million and up to 600 troops toward UN missions. Our commitment to re-engage Canada in positive ways with the world. That promise still has yet to be fulfilled. It might take a couple centuries to bring lasting peace, but to do that, we have got to sustain our desire to go well beyond our borders. Always a fascinating conversation with General Delaire. And a reminder, our coverage of the National Remembrance Day ceremony here in Ottawa starts at 10 a.m. Eastern. South of the border, the FBI is investigating threatening letters sent to election offices in half a dozen states. Some of those letters laced with a dangerous drug. CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joe Malbin on what officials are now calling domestic terrorism. Just days after state elections where Americans voted on everything from governors to abortion rights, the FBI is on the hunt for those responsible for sending threatening letters to election offices, some of those letters laced with the drug fentanyl. So far, no one's been harmed. This is a form of domestic terrorism, that's all that it is. Forcing evacuations and terrorizing election workers. Some of the menacing mail like this in Washington state included the message, end elections now, we are in charge now. We're going into a presidential election, uh, things are only going to get crazier, possibly, hopefully not. The letters were sent to some battleground states from California, Nevada, Texas, Oregon, Washington State and to Georgia's largest election office, Fulton County, where workers in 2020 were harassed and accused falsely by Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani of stuffing ballots to help Joe Biden win the state. There is nowhere I feel safe. Nowhere. Officials intercepted a second letter to Georgia, and security has been beefed up at election offices across the U.S. Workers warned to be on alert. This is just extremely distressing to think this is where uh, some people would go and how some people would behave and threatening uh, people just doing their job, making sure we have fair and honest elections. The FBI is treating about a dozen letters as all connected because of the timing. Whoever is behind it trying to stop elections and threatening workers will bring about some serious charges. Omar?
All right, Joy, thanks. Coming up, an escalating fight far from the battleground. Social media really gives both sides the power to tell their own stories. Competing digital narratives as the war rages on. Plus, a chance reunion for a veteran pilot and his navigator. Far from the front lines of the war in the Middle East, there is another battle raging online. CTV's Adrian Gobriel on the competing campaigns of propaganda. As a war is waged on the ground, Hamas and Israel are fighting a modern day battle for support online. As tensions heighten across the world. Social media really gives both sides the power to tell their own stories to frame the conflict, um, you know, with their own agenda. For weeks now, Hamas and the Israeli Defense Force have been producing and sharing their own content as they fight for hearts and minds, according to sociology professor Caitlin Mendez. We think about this as a larger kind of PR campaign. They want to get international support. One example of the communication battle happening in real time, October 17th, a missile reportedly hits a hospital inside Gaza. Hamas blames Israel. Protests erupt. Leaders of the Arab world even cancel a scheduled meeting with President Biden. Israel quickly denies the claims, saying Islamic jihadists inside Gaza are to blame. Back about 15 years ago, Hamas was greatly outpaced by the Israelis they, they, on social media. Um, and since that time, Hamas has made efforts uh, fairly sophisticated efforts to catch up and to be able to, to deal with Israel on the social media battlefield. The number of new followers on Hamas-linked channels on the messaging app Telegram have skyrocketed since the conflict began. Author Philip Sieb recently penned this book titled Information at War. He believes both sides are publishing their own propaganda online at record speed. The Israelis can say what they want to say and get and reach immediately the entire social media universe. Hamas can do the same thing, as can their supporters. So we're not just seeing raw footage. We're seeing footage that's sometimes backed by music that can kind of make you feel certain emotions, whether it's sadness or anger or rage. Those we spoke with also note that the sheer volume of misinformation being shared on social media is making the fog of war that much more dense and difficult to navigate for those searching for factual news and information. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Still ahead. Always do what's best for the health of the player. Not all hockey stars wear skates, honoring six decades of service. The Montreal Canadiens are honoring a team member who never scored a goal or made a save, but whose work was occasionally life-saving. Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin on the Habs MVP, our most valuable physician. In his honor. From his spot behind the players' bench, Dr. David Mulder watched over his team for decades, always ready to jump on the ice to assist those the game of hockey bruised and banged up. Mulder played a key role with the Montreal Canadiens as head physician over years of transformations. All the padding is uh, much more protective. The whole league is aware of a concussion and how uh, serious it can be. Mulder grew up playing hockey in Saskatchewan, eventually becoming a thoracic surgeon in Montreal. But his passion for the game led him to lend his medical skills to the Montreal Canadiens farm team in 1963. He was picked up by the big leagues six years later. When he was first drafted, the push was to get players back on the ice as fast as possible. But Mulder learned a valuable lesson from a hockey legend. The lesson that Jean Belvo taught me, always do what's best for the health of the player. Don't take any pressure from management, the press, the fans, or a playoff situation. And that was probably the best advice I had as a rookie. That earned him the ire of Habs enforcer Chris Nyland, who he says wanted to punch him for benching him with a sprained ankle during a Stanley Cup final. He's forgiven me now, but... Uh... Mulder was named head physician in 1999. It's the first uh, operation I've ever done when I finished the operation and looked up the patient had skates on. The slap shot of Tarion... That patient was Trent McCleary. In 2000, a puck crushed his larynx, collapsing his lung. Fast intervention saved his life and led to an NHL-wide policy about the team doctor having a seat nearby. 
Through six decades of treating tough patients, tough cases, through eight Stanley Cup championships, Mulder also left a mark on trauma care in Quebec. And while he's hung up his stethoscope as a hockey doc, he still has advice for the sport he loves. I would love to see fighting removed from the NHL. But that's, uh, that's not a popular opinion with the crowd. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. After the break, brothers in arms. Two Canadian veterans found each other 65 years later. We leave you tonight with a heartwarming reunion. CTV's Judy Trin on the brothers in arms who reconnected six decades later. Side by side again, the pilot and the navigator, 65 years after they first met. He passed over the list of uh, new arrivals, and that's when I saw Tom's name. And I said, oh my God, it's Tom's here. In 1958, James Shipton and Tom Wilson flew together on the Canadair North Star. Wilson describes himself as a chauffeur and Shipton, the brains. Navigators were were the most important person in the crew. They, they got us to our destination and they brought us home again. Shipton served in the Korean War, mapping the flight path to transport American soldiers and supplies across the Pacific. The North Star aircraft flew more than two million kilometers without a fatal crash and brought home 13,000 soldiers. They were quite happy to be, to be going home. And uh, we often had uh, Canadian Air Force nurses who were on exchange with the American Air Force, and they were often on the crew that helped us uh, bring back the, the wounded to the States. Wilson began his military career in the Second World War as an air gunner, then trained to be a pilot with the Royal Canadian Air Force during peacetime. He and Shipton landed at 412 Squadron in Ottawa. I thought it was a wonderful place to, to fly. The veterans are immensely proud of their squadron, which had the best safety record at the time. We, we studied our map, studied the, the ground layout, where we were going, to know what facilities were there to take care of the aircraft. This Remembrance Day, the veterans, now in their 90s, will remember their past colleagues but also reflect on how they've come full circle, no longer together in a cockpit, but grateful for a renewed friendship. Judy Trin, CTV News, Ottawa. Clearly a beautiful bond. And that's a snapshot of this Friday. Thank you for watching and see you in the morning for our Remembrance Day coverage live from right here in Ottawa. Good night.